There is more to picking a case than just good looks like me. We walk you through some of those steps on how to do so right here on Robitech. Whoa! Today, we are going to walk through basic PC build form factors, things to consider when choosing a case when it comes to cooling, things to consider when choosing a case when it comes to building, and steps to take after you've chosen a PC case. Now, the first step to choosing a PC case is, of course, choosing a form factor, because this is gonna determine a lot about what kind of case you're gonna be looking for. So let's talk about basic PC building form factors. There are more than just these four, but we're gonna talk about the four major ones. There is Mini ITX, Micro ATX, ATX, and of course, EATX. There is usually a correlation between the size of the motherboard and the size of the cases. I will be super clear that as I've been walking through these form factors, I'm talking about the actual motherboard size, but that motherboard size, like I said, actually ties the cases. First, let's start with Mini ITX. Mini ITX, which stands for Mini Information Technology Extended, is synonymous with SFF, or what are called small form factor builds. These are by far the most difficult builds, just given the infinite amount of power in an itty bitty living space. Phenomenal cosmic power. Itty bitty living space. By the way, that is an Aladdin joke. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Airflow is going to be a major consideration for these as cramming so much into one of these can create a massive heat death trap. You do also need to pay attention to the limitations of the case way more than any other form factor. You are also going to be limited by what are called small form factor power supplies. They are unique to small form factor builds, and in some cases, some builds require external power sources or power bricks. In short, these are complicated builds because the amount of cables, the amount of work that has to go into making these happen is almost masterful. And actually, I think what Josiah is gonna show you right here is something that's from our mini ITX build is just how much cables we had to get to get the, what is essentially six fans inside of this Razer Tomahawk mini ITX build. Now, the other thing that you need to also understand about mini ITX, which is the smallest of the form factors, these are going to limit the options in terms of things like hard drives, in terms of PCI slots, in terms of uh, just expandability. In fact, Mini ITX only usually has two DIMMs of RAM and only sometimes has a single M.2 slot. So even though you get the build built, you don't have a lot of expansion and expandability with things like uh, using a Mini ITX. So that's everything that you need to know about Mini ITX. Now let's talk about Micro ATX. Micro ATX, or Micro Advanced Technology Extended, is the second of the smallest form factors in terms of the size of motherboards. These have some of the benefits of Mini ITX without some of the headaches. Mini ITX do work in these cases. In fact, Mini ITX will work in ATX and EATX cases, but Micro ATX will not work in Mini ITX because it's too large. These are for people who wanna have builds that have a small footprint, but also wanna have a lot of power and versatility within their builds. Most components, GPU, CPU, certain coolers will absolutely work in this build. You are still limited by the amount of space that you have within the case, so you do need to be smart. So you don't wanna jam, like, these aren't the kind of cases where you're gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna put in Lee and Lee streamers, and oh, I'm gonna put in a thousand hard drives, or oh, I'm gonna turn this into a NAS. That's not what this form factor is about. Now, airflow is still important here given cases are still small and components are still crammed close together. And power here can also be SFF, or you could have what are called standard ATX, which is like more your typical power supply. Again, because of the smaller form factor, there are lean bits here. You're not gonna have as many PCIe lanes. You're not gonna have as many uh, USB ports. You're not gonna have as many M.2. Some of these will actually only have two DIMMs as well. So again, if you're looking for something that's like easily expandable, this may not be something that you want to consider a grow into build. Now, let's talk about ATX. ATX, which we gave you what the acronym stands for earlier, is the most common form factor and the majority of the builds that you see. Kind of your world is an oyster build and by far having the largest selection. On top of tyranny of choice, you do have to be intentional about your research to ensure you're making good choices. Mini ITX, micro ATX, ATX, and even in some cases, EATX boards will actually work in some what are considered ATX mid-tower cases. Airflow is still an issue, but 
more forgiving in this case, just because of the amount of room. And this is the easiest by far of the form factors to build in and can be the most suited for beginners, both in choosing parts and building in the PC for the first time. The majority of things, whether that's PC builders, YouTube video guides, all those other things are gonna be really kind of focused around ATX builds because this is the one that most people do. Now, lastly, there is one, the big behemoth, the end all be all, let's talk about EATX. EATX, or Extended Advanced Technology Extended. Yes, that's right, there's two extendeds in this. Uh, you know what, nobody said that we were any good at actually naming things. In most cases, when we're talking about EATX birds, you have access to workstation level chips and motherboards in more abundance when you're talking about EATX. And the reason I'm kind of saying that is that there are actual ATX motherboards, and in fact, even micro ATX motherboards, and in rare occasions, mini ITX motherboards that will still work with like Xeon chips and Threadripper chips, etc. But when you start getting to EATX, that's when you're gonna have the majority of like your uber powerful MSI Godlikes, your Zenith 2 Extremes, and all of these really just crazy both like prosumer level boards and at the same time workstation boards that work not only with your desktop chips, but also your workstation chips like Threadripper, et cetera. These provide by far the most opportunity in terms of the hardware because of the additional connectivity of the motherboard and just the sheer amount of room that exists within the case. Now cooling does actually begin to become important here because new aspects you may not have considered are added that may need to be cooled. For instance, we're doing this really ridiculous Threadripper build and now we actually have to worry about cooling our capture cards because of how close they are to our two Crossfire GPUs. So again, you start to see that with EATX, depending on the kind of use case you may have, you might actually have to consider cooling actually way more than you may have done in a normal ATX build. Power is another concern as PSU requirements may both change both the size of the power supply as well as the power needed uh, for the additional hardware. Now that we have made a decision on form factor, let's talk about the things you consider when you're thinking about your case and cooling. Now we have done some videos that are really in depth on the different parts of cooling. But first let's just talk about these at a high level and then we'll point you to the videos later on so you can basically do a deep dive if you really want to. When you talk about air cooling and you wanna talk about specifically for air cooling builds, you're looking for front panels and side panels that are very open and good for unimpeded airflow. Like ugh, this, because I can see right through it. A pretty good sign for an easy airflow build. Now, if you wanna get a full rundown of air cooling and how to plan for your build, you should check our video out right here. We just did a completely in-depth guide on this whole thing. Second, let's talk about all-in-one cooling. You actually have more options in terms of cases because of the use of what are called high static pressure fans. What this means is you can have cases where, unlike this case where you have an actual open unimpeded front, you can use things like the NZXT H510, where you actually have a closed front and because of high static pressure fans, you're actually able to pull air from places that normal airflow fans can't do. Now for a full rundown of AIO cooling, you can check out this video right here if it's live. The last thing you wanna consider before we go into the crazy is actually GPU cooling. In certain cases, choosing a really fat GPU may not actually be the best option if the thing can't get a ton of airflow. One example is our $10,000 build. We have two ASUS Strix RTX 3090s that are an NVLink configuration that look at these things. They're right up against each other. You know that that top one is getting no air. Again, didn't choose the parts for this. This was something that they wanted to have done, but a, an idea of when you plan your build, you need to make sure that your GPU, just as much as your CPU, is getting the air that it needs. Let's talk a little bit about water cooling. I'll be honest, you need to find videos and images of your case to ensure it's going to work. You need to account for things like pump res combos or distribution plates. You need to make sure you have enough room for you to run tube runs, especially if you're gonna do hard tubing. You need to be able to connect radiators and be able to ensure that fittings can go in and out of them. There have been so many times that I've seen people place radiators against radiators and all of a sudden it's like, how am I gonna connect these? Again, this can be very complicated and it just takes a lot of time. People can misjudge this part and they find they can't do runs correctly. Remember, if you're going to add radiators, you're also going to need to add fans, which is going to make things thicker. Not to mention, pay attention to your radiator thickness as well. The thicker the radiator, the less room you're gonna to have to do runs, but you wanna make sure that of course you have enough cooling capacity to cool on the components that are part of your loop. Now one bonus, if you are putting a water block on your GPU, you don't have to worry as much about the airflow to the GPU, just to the radiator, which is actually cooling the thing. So there's that little additional thing. You've considered your case for cooling, 
and you know your form factor, let's talk about things to consider that actually make your building experience great. First and foremost, the most important thing, and this is something that you really honestly have to do, you need to visualize your build. Even myself, who has over 300 plus builds under my belt, find myself having to scramble to finish a build because I didn't walk through all the parts and ensure they will fit. Things like EATX, cooler mounting, RAM clearance, GPU clearance, if a PSU fits, to have your, your world crushed because you just didn't work through all the parts correctly can be so frustrating. Now for some very specific examples. Take a look at this. Consider the area around the motherboard and how much room you have. If you're going to top mount your radiator, you should consider if the AIO is gonna have clearance for the RAM, or even if just room on top is gonna to make it so your build is difficult when you mount that cooler. Things like you may need to connect all your connections in the top panel before mounting the IO, like your EPS CPU power, because you won't be able to reach it when the AIO is mounted. For instance, when you look at the top of this case, you can see there's very little room clearance here at the top, so when you have fans in your AIO, all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I may have to connect certain things because I just don't have the room up here to actually be able to get to them once my AIO is mounted, if I were to top mount it. If you're gonna be front mounting your AIO, know how long your tubes are gonna be, especially if you're gonna be doing tubes down in builds. Also note there are cases, like for instance, the Azacast 808, that will only allow you to front mount one specific way. And that's given that there's no room on the top for the, the tubes to be, so you have to do it tube down. Or there might be certain cases where the PSU shroud is so up against the uh, front panel that you can't actually do tubes down in specific circumstances. If you're gonna be using a big fat GPU, you may need to consider a GPU sag bracket. Some cases come with them. But other cases like the Lee and Lee 01 Dynamic severely limit your choices and in some circumstances won't let you use one at all. Cable management is important. Not just to make something look good, which I know you all don't do because I get so many things on Twitter about like, why do you take the time to make the back look good? But also just to ensure you have room to fit anything. Let's talk about the Razer Tomahawk, which I guess I'm gonna show you again right here, the mini ITX one. Again, we had six fans of which four were RGB and those thermal take fans required massive, super thick cables. And we were trying to cram a ton of cables into a very small space. In fact, we had to not only get it, uh, we not only had to completely redo the cable management, but we also had to sit it on a table and stick on, stuff on top of it to ensure that we train the cables enough to compress so the cable, so the side panel would actually close correctly. Modular in a case can help a bunch. Things like being able to move hard drive trays, like in the Corsair 5000D. If you've got a really massive PSU and you need to shove that in there, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I have this much room to basically fit all of my PSU cables, not gonna happen. But in many cases, you can actually move the hard drive trays. Removing panels to add more fans, again, things like the Corsair 5000D or even the Fantex uh, P200, which allow you to actually remove panels so you can do things like side mount radiators. Modularity in a case, which usually has a tendency to come with a higher price tag, is actually going to save you a ton of heartache when you get further along in your build. Take the time to look at the things you like in builds and ensure that your case has the ability to fit those aesthetic choices for things like routing cables or putting tubes the way you like. Also, if you have RGB on the case, see how it hooks up and ensure that you have not only the room in the case, but the room on the motherboard to be able to work it. Guys, look for the details in your cases. Like areas in the P500A where you can run those GPU cables down and it looks so clean. Or the ability to remove the radiator mount and attach everything outside of the case, like on the Razer Tomahawk or the NZXT H510. Those little details make your build circumstances so nice. Or even the ability to remove the entire cage housing, like the Azacast 808 or the Antec Dark Cube. Though this can be a reverse curse because you now need to ensure that everything fits back in it once you put the shroud back on, but it makes it really easy to work around the case and do everything because everything is exposed. For RGB, ensure that it's actually visible if you're gonna spend the money. Some cases like the H510 non-elite version don't have tempered glass or mesh in the front, so you can't really see front-mounted RGB fans. Other cases have issues in placing RGB strips like the Thermaltake View 37 because the case is rounded and it doesn't have a good way to really mount them. So again, paying attention to these details and not just buying parts because you're like, hey, this guy has really awesome stuff and then I can just put it in my case isn't always a good strategy. 
Lastly, and the one I forget a ton, ensure that your motherboard supports the front panel connections on your case. All too often I have gotten motherboards that don't have a USB-C connection on the front panel, meaning I'm tucking away a cable that could be completely used if I'd just been intentional about making sure that I chose something that way. Now, you might literally be like, hey, I don't wanna spend the money to connect USB-C and that's fine, but it's when it's an accident that it doesn't necessarily feel good. Well guys, that is it. I hope all of these little tips and tricks and bits of knowledge that I was able to partake on you are gonna help you be able to choose a case more effectively. Guys, again, there are so many times that a lot of people, when they do a PC part picker or whatever it was, they just don't consider these things, specifically when they go and try and plan out a build. And all I wanna do is make your life a whole lot better when you plan this build out effectively. Now, I'd love to know down in the comments below, is there anything we missed? If there's anything that we could have done that makes it easier for you to choose a case or something that we might have missed. Again, we had a lot of people look at this, but there's all these things that we can do better. Let us know all of that stuff down in the comments below. Now, while you're down there, make sure you slap that subscribe button, whip that like button, and ring that notification bell so you get a notification each and every time we go live here on the channel or when we post a new video. Speaking of live, we have a live show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday starting at 5.30 p.m. We would love to have you come visit us either here on YouTube or over on Twitch. And also, if you just want more of us, check us out on all the socials. We're everywhere. We can check us out on the TikTok, doing dances, on the Insta, putting all those PC pictures up, or you can check us out on Twitter, just doing things and saying things like PCs are bussing. Guys, this has been absolutely awesome. We hope you've enjoyed the video, and we look forward to teaching you some more on the next one.